All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. And we're going to continue uh, to finish Mark 10, 32 through 52, which is 20 verses. And uh, that we're going to continue with the same thesis that we looked at last week, which is looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of, of the throne of God. So looking unto Jesus uh, as, the, as our example. And we've been seeing this. This is a review from last week. How he came down, the Bible says he came down on the eastern side of uh, the Jordan. Remember, he has not been, we're about to go into the last week of his life on earth. And he's coming down the valley, that valley of death, as, as, as it were. And he's going to come down all the way, and he's going to make his abode right there. He's going to stay right there where John the Baptist was first baptizing. But the whole time, he's going to be on the eastern side. Very um, informative. He's going to stay on the eastern side of the Jordan. And the Jordan has always been a type of death. When you enter into the land, you've got to cross the Jordan, just like you cross the Red Sea. At the Red Sea, Jesus died for you. At the Jordan, you die to self, to enter into the, the victorious of the conquest of the land, you know, so, and Jesus answered and said, Verily I say unto you, there is no man that has left house, or brethren, or sisters, or father, or mother, or wife, or children, or lands, for my sake, and the gospels, but he shall receive a hundredfold now in this time. This is an answering to what Peter says, Lord, we have left all and followed you. Because he has been talking about, he's been talking about how, remember the, the man that came and he says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And he says, well, you're going to, the short of it is he says, go ahead and sell all that you have. But that doesn't apply to all of us, you know. That's, if you make riches your, 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 your confidence, then that applies to you. Because you can be very rich and still be using it for the Lord's glory. Um, be using it, be, being a good steward. Verily I say unto you, and he says, for my sake and the gospels, but he shall receive an hundredfold now at this time. If you, he, that's what in answering to Peter. And then uh, houses and brethren, sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions. And in the world to come, eternal life. But many that are first shall be last, and the last shall be first. So notice how he says with persecutions as well. You're going to get that as well. And it's good. If you're persecuted for the Lord's sake, that's good. That's like a badge, you know. You got a badge. You paid the dues, and that's, that's a good thing, you know. Um, but that's interesting. In verse 31, he says, But many that are first shall be last, and the last first. What that means is we looked at, la at that last week. And it means that <clears throat> throughout time, especially during those dark ages that they call the 13th century, especially when, before Luther uh, started the Reformation, you had a lot of people that the way they dealt with the flesh was go live in a monastery. You know, a lot of people, and even now people still do that. Uh, people that go to uh, women go to convents and men go to monasteries to uh, to take on a, a, a vow of poverty, and uh, that's how you deal with the flesh. But God says, you know, that's that would seem like that would be the people that are going to be first. But the Lord says, not necessarily. The first shall be last, and the last shall be first. Because you can be very rich, and yet uh, if you're a good steward, you don't have to be living in a monastery. You can be enjoying your castle having your cake and eating it too. The Lord says, those could very well be the first people. You know, that's what he means here. You don't have to take a vow of poverty because the Lord says he's given us, look what he says in 1 Timothy 6, 17. Charge them that are rich in this world that they be not high-minded, nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who giveth us richly all things to enjoy. 
So if you can have money and enjoy it, by all means, you know, do it. Have a yacht. It's okay. Um, now, this was taken last May when I was in Israel. This is the Jordan. Uh, this is the Jordan. Of course, I was on the Israeli side, so that means that, that uh, I'm looking across the Jordan. That's looking towards the Dead Sea, right there. And they were in the way going up to Jerusalem, and Jesus went before them, and they were amazed. And as they followed, they were afraid. And he took again the twelve and began to tell them what things should happen unto him. Notice, that's where he's at right now. He's at the place where John the Baptist was, had been um, baptizing, but he's on the eastern side of the Jordan. And notice when the Bible says up and down, it really means literally that, because you're at 1,300 feet below sea level right there. And to climb up to Jerusalem, that's um, 2,500 feet above sea level. So that's quite a climb. And uh, I've gone by bus and by car. Those, and and you, you are going up, you know. It's a beautiful, it's a beautiful sight when you first see the buildings of Jerusalem. It's, I mean, you get goosebumps. Because one, one day, uh, it's going to be like it was always meant to be, the city of the world, the city of peace. But notice it says, it says, in the way going up to Jerusalem, uh, Jesus went before them. He is truly our leader, our master. He, he says, he went before us, even unto death. You know, so we, did, we experienced the valley but as the shadow of death, but he dealt with the real thing. So he goes on before us. And they were amazed as they followed him and were afraid. Because at one point in, in John 11, he's, Thomas says, well, let us go with him so we, that, so we all die. You know, they knew. Lord, why do you want to go to Jerusalem? They're going to kill you. We're about to start here in chapter 11. We're going to start the, the final week of his life here on earth. So we're, we're about to enter that um, in this chapter. what things should happen unto him. He's telling them, uh, he's been telling them all the way down the valley, he's been telling them what's going to happen to him. Isaiah 50, uh, verse 7, For the Lord God will help me, therefore shall I not be confounded, therefore I have set my face like a flint, and I know that I shall not be ashamed. He trusted in his father. He says, though I be slain, like, like, uh, like uh, Job said, though I be killed, yet still I trust in the Lord God. Uh, so here the Lord is, he said, he set his face like a flint, Isaiah tells us. Adam, he, he, he was going straight into, right into death. And he knew this. He knew he, where he was going and what was going to be done to him. Because look what we're told saying, Behold, we go to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man shall be delivered unto the chief priests and unto the scribes, and they shall condemn him to death, and shall deliver him to the Gentiles, and they shall mock him, and shall, shall scourge him, and shall spit upon him, and shall kill him, and the third day he shall rise again. We're going up to Jerusalem, and this is what's going to happen. They're going to kill him. But he always stand, tells them, and I'm going to rise the third day. This is amazing how it doesn't seem to penetrate them. And I'm thinking, do we do that? Oh, yeah, we do that. Because the Lord says constantly, if you read the Psalms, constantly tells you, trust me, trust me. And the first time something goes wrong with us, like a flat tire, we, we panic. Yeah. You know, we panic. You know, oh, no, I'm going to be late. I'm going to get fired. Duh. You know, it's okay. Enjoy this morning. Look, in Mark 8, 31, he told us, and he began to teach them. This is the first time he tells them. And he began to teach them, the Son of Man must suffer many things, and he be rejected of the elders and of the chief priests and scribes, and be killed, and after three days, rise again. This is the first time he tells them, up at Caesarea Philippi. Now he tells them again in 9, 31, for he taught his disciples and said unto them, the Son of Man is delivered unto the hands of men, and they shall kill him, and after that he'll be killed and rise up the third, and, and shall rise the third day. 
Now, he adds a little more here, a little more data. Isn't it amazing? The Lord doesn't give us everything at one point. And there's a place where the Lord says in the Old Testament, I won't, I won't let the, the beast increase. I, I won't give you the land in one fell swoop right. because the beast will increase against you. And, and to me, folks, it's a, when the Lord tells us in, 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 um, in Jeremiah that the heart is desperately wicked and deceitful above all things, we, do really, we don't really believe that. You know, we don't really believe that. We want to tell the Lord, really, I'm not that bad. But that if the, I often think if the Lord showed you your heart right there on the spot, you might be tempted to quit and say, Lord, I'm, I'm not really bad. Amen, and turn back. And that's why the Lord doesn't do that. He doesn't want to scare you, right. showing you your heart. And Because uh, if it does that, you, you're likely to quit or turn back. But notice, every time he tells him, he adds a little bit more. Here, and the second time he tells him, he tells him, delivered unto the hands of men. He's going to be betrayed. And then now, the third time he tells him, he said, that's a little bit more. And shall deliver him to the Gentiles, and they shall mock him, scourge him, and spit upon him. Amazing detail. How did he know this stuff? We tend to want to think, well, he's God. But folks... We're told how he got this stuff. How did he know all this? Luke 18, 31 says, Then he took unto them the twelve and said unto them, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and all things that are written by the prophets concerning the Son of Man shall be accomplished. So he was reading the Bible. And so this causes me to think, you know, we have all the information we need. It has been written. It's just that we don't read it, or we don't go in between the lines and read all the details. But everything that you need to know, it's there. Look, I'll just give you an example of what was going to happen to him in, in Psalm 22. The whole psalm is like this. <clears throat> my strength is dried up like a pot shirt, and my tongue cleaveth to my jaws, and thou hast brought me into the dust of death. For dogs have come past me, the assembly of the wicked have enclosed me, they pierce my hands and my feet. I may tell all my bones, they look and stare upon me. They part my garments among them. They cast lots on my vesture. That, folks, that tells me that is, I mean, when your joints are out of socket like that and they stare upon you, that's got to be painful. And the dogs, that's the Gentiles. You know, we looked at that earlier on. <clears throat> and he must have been very thirsty and hurting and awful pain. It causes you to, if you look it, into that, it's a painful thing he was going through. And he knew that ahead of time because he read it concerning him. You know? And James and John, the sons of Zebedee, come unto him, saying, Master, we would that thou shouldest do for us whatsoever we desire. And he said unto them, What would you that I should do for you? They said unto him, Grant unto us that we may sit, one on the right hand and the other on the left hand, in thy glory. He just told them what's going to happen to him and Guys, this is not the time to be do talking about this. But that's us. We do that. Um, we're talking about glory. But it's not that they were wrong, because the Lord has told them before. He told them before. And in Matthew 20, 21, he says, And he said unto her, What wilt thou? And she says, Now concerning this, this is, uh, um, this is the mother of James and John. It's, Matthew says that the mother came and asked them, asked him, but really it was the boys that had put her up to it. And that's why Mark deals with the swords right off the bat. It wasn't so much the mother that wanted this, but the boys, they wanted that. One on the left and one on the right. Grant that these my sons may sit, the one on the right hand and the other on the left hand, in thy kingdom. Now, they, they weren't wrong to ask for that because they were told before. This is what the Lord had already mentioned to them in Matthew 19, 28. Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto you that you which have followed me in the regeneration, when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory, you also shall sit, shall sit upon the twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. So they had every right to ask for that. So they were only coming and saying, no, we want to sit next to you, Lord. That's it. So they wanted the proximity. But uh, otherwise, they weren't wrong in asking that. But Jesus said unto them, you know not what you ask. Can you drink of the cup that I shall drink of? And be baptized with the baptism that I shall be baptized with. And they said unto him, We can. 
And Jesus said unto them, Ye shall indeed drink of the cup that I drink of, and with the baptism, baptism that I am baptized, with us shall you be baptized. It's amazing how quick they are to say, yeah, we can. Because, I mean, if they only looked into it, but it's a good thing they, they, they didn't. Because there's things in our lives that are coming down the road that it's a good thing the Lord doesn't show us. Uh, hard things, painful things that are coming. Uh, and the Lord, he showed us, he's already showed us the valley. Remember, he says, he gave us a glimpse of what's at the end of the valley. He says, by, when he took Peter, James, and John up to the mount, and he showed them, there's glory, guys. At the end of the, at the valley, there's glory. That was the transfiguration. He says, this is what you're going to get at the end. But first, we've got to deal with the cross. We're going to go down there. So if we knew that, if we could stay upon that, no matter what the Lord gives us, uh, like when he told Ezekiel, son of man, I'm going to take your love today. And he says, I'm going to take your wife. You know, be able to handle it because I'm going to take her. Isn't it amazing? The Lord told Ezekiel that. And Jeremiah, he told Jeremiah, I think Jeremiah had a girl he had his eyes on because the Lord says, uh-uh, it ain't going to happen. Forget that. And I'm thinking, and Jeremiah says, Lord, get somebody else to do the job for you. He says, no, you're the man. So this is things that God brings upon us. Now, know you now, you don't know what you're asking. That's what he's telling him. Can you drink of the cup, the hand that has been dealt to us? And we've all been dealt the hand, you know, the cup. It's, uh, so, that, so he's done, the, and the baptism. That, that is something that you're going to be totally immersed in, overwhelmed with. Something that's coming down the road that God's, who, who, God has selected his people. He's going to do this with. Now, he doesn't do that with everybody. Um, when, when I first got here, you know, right off the bat, when I got to Wesatch, uh, I, I, was, I saw what Brother Bess had, was going through. And it's amazing, folks. If you, if you weren't here in 2012 when it all started, I think, you know, one thing after another, big things, you know, big things that happened to him. And I, I, and I thought, I don't know, is he going to quit? Because if he quits, you know, I'm left dangling. I'm going to have to move on someplace else to teach somewhere else else. But Brother Bez, the storm came and it hit him and he bent and he swayed down to the ground and stuff. But then when the sunshine came back up, he's there again. And I told a, a pastor friend of mine, he says, you're looking at a modern day Job. These are things that come into our lives. This, this is the cup. And this is the baptism you're dealt with. And so how are you going to deal with it? Because there's glory that's going to be uh, given to you. And God chooses whom he's going to give that to because of the glory that's coming. Um, you shall indeed. And when he says that, you know what, folks? These two guys, James and John, James was the first martyr. And John was the last one. Uh, sources say that John was boiled in oil. Good night. It's a no, at least he was already 80 or so when that happened to him. And James was a bit younger, but he was decapitated uh, there in Jerusalem. So they were like bookends. They, they came to one on the left and one on the right. <laughs> you okay, you got the deal, guys. They got it, but again, they're going to get glory, you know? Isn't that amazing? Um, but to sit on my right hand and on my left hand is not mine to give, but it shall be given unto them for whom it is prepared. And when the ten heard it, they were much displeased with James and John. He says, you dirty dogs. You want to, well, we thought of it first, you know, too bad. You know? <laughs> they all wanted it, you know, it's just that whoever asked for it first, you get it. Um, not mine to give. And look what he says. But it shall be given to them whom to for him it is prepared. So the cup and the baptism, God says, those come, but the Lord has already prepared as well the glory that's going to come, the honor that's going to come. He's doing that. The Lord is choosing that. He's preparing that. Because um, often, I've often thought that. It wouldn't it be neat to be part of that group that the Lord is preparing something special? Oh, that would be neat. But... I wouldn't want the valley, though. That's, ah, I don't want the valley, you know? Um, but who knows? But Jesus called unto him and says unto them, 
you know that they which are accounted to rule over the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and their great ones exercise authority upon them. But so shall I not be among you, but whosoever will be great among you shall be your minister. So he's telling them, it's not like that, guys. You're not going to be doing what the world does. And the world does that. You get glory in the world by how many people you're over. And the Lord says, it's not going to be like that. Um, so don't be thinking like that. Because he points it out a number of times there. But so shall it be among, so shall it not be among you. But whosoever shall be uh, great among you shall be also your minister. And um, there shall be no competition. 1 Corinthians 12, 20, 21, And the eye cannot say unto the hand, I have no need of thee, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of thee, have you? You know, the body, we're as a body, and we're not in competition. And you really see it, folks. You really see it when you become, uh, when you start ministering in a local church, you see how the church works together. Amen. And you can see it like this VBS we just had. The past two VBSs, I was directing it, and at the end of VBS, we had quarrels. We had things that weren't, there were things that were went wrong, went wrong and I just wanted to go home. I said, nah, you know, I'll let the pastor deal with that. There were families that were, there were families that were displeased, you know. There was things that shouldn't have been done. There were, the food was wrong, and then, that, that, you know, things that happened, I said, I wash my hands of that thing, you know. I just did what I, what I could, but this year, we had somebody else. I had, we had Michelle, uh, uh, Miss Cummins over at, in charge of the VBS. And it was amazing, folks, how everybody did their part. All I did was teach. That was my thing. That's all I wanted to do the whole time. We had uh, Miss Amanda directing it. I says, oh, great. That's, 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 that's hers. And uh, I wouldn't want to do Brother Mark's piece, you know, either. You know, that's his piece. He does it great, you know. I said, that's his part. But don't forget Miss Marcy. Wow. She's behind the scenes doing all the coordinating, you know, getting them supplies and things. You got so many pieces, and they're all doing their part. And VBS comes together. You know, it comes. I was talking with Miss Michelle the other night, and we're talking about that. I said, isn't it amazing? Everybody there. And there are pieces that are still coming. You know, there's coming. As the, the time goes on, but that's what it means when it's a, when it, all the pieces come together. It's a well-oiled machine, and the Lord does that. That's what He's saying. There's no competition because everything works together fine. Amen. That's Amen. the way it should be. Uh, be not called rabbi, for one is your master, even Christ, and all ye are brethren. So He tells us that all of y'all are brothers. There shouldn't be any competition. And see, that's why we have no vestments here. You don't see the pastor dressed up in special garb or special garments like in other religions because God doesn't want that. Uh, the vestry is not for us. The vestments or special garments, God doesn't like that. You know, some Protestant sects do have that. And the Lord did have it in the Old Testament. Look at this. Aaron shall come in. The, the, the high priest has a beautiful garment on. That was beautiful. That thing, uh, the, the coat had golden threads in it. Can you imagine what it looked like in the sun? Ooh. Uh, and then the special thing that he had on his forehead, holiness unto the Lord, that was beautiful. But look what he says in Leviticus 16, 23. And Aaron shall come into the tabernacle of the congregation and shall put off the linen garments which he put on when he went into the holy place and shall leave them there. And he shall come and wash his flesh with water in the holy place and put on his garments and come forth and offer his burnt sacrifice and the burnt offering of the people and shall make an atonement for himself and for the people. On the day of atonement, the a high priest took his beautiful garments off. And if you, when you saw the high priest among people with his garments, you said, whoa, that's the high priest. You couldn't mistake him. But when he takes his garments off, he says, who is that? That just looks like a regular Levite. Right. But folks, that was the high priest in his regular garments. I mean, his garments. But look at this. What this shows us, he's going to come forth and offer for his offering. Not The Lord didn't have to offer for himself, but when he comes, he comes, as it were, in the clothing of humanity, and you yeah. can't spot him. 
It says in Philippians 2, 7, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of man and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death in the death of the cross. So you can't tell him apart. This is God, folks. That's all there. I was just talking at Best Buy Saturday. I was talking to, a, a, or Friday, I was talking to this young man uh, about the Macs that are coming. And uh, he's a Jehovah Witness. And uh, I says, okay, let's get to it. So who is Jesus? Because right. I, I, I got to get out of here. Right. Who is Jesus? And he says, well, he's, I says, who is he? He says, well, he's, uh, he's, uh, he was sputtering and stuff. He says, he's not God. I says, okay, there's a big difference. He is God. Amen. You know, uh, we'll be talking. Here's my email, and we'll talk. We'll talk. But to get to the bottom, Jesus is God, yeah. you know? And he doesn't look like him, but he is, you know? And whosoever of you will be the chiefest shall be servant of all, for even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. The Son of Man came, and that's what he liked to call himself, the Son of Man, because he became a man. You know, he was a man and gave his life a ransom. That means a redemption price. He came to pay the price. That's what he came for. <coughs> Ezekiel, son of man, thy brethren, even thy brethren, the son of thy kindred. Look how many times it was repeated here. And that's what he called himself that, the son of man. Because he came to be one of us. He came, you know, all these years that I, I, I worked with kids, I would always tell them, I said, you know, it's like this. The Lord, let's say all of us is a bunch of Fritos. And the Lord says, how am I not talking about a bunch of Fritos? He said, I know what, I'll become a Frito. And the Lord did that. He became a Frito and talked to us. I said, oh, you're just a Frito. I said, no, I'll meet you guys, but I'm here as a Frito. And the kids could understand that. You know, this is, oh, that, yeah, that's God. He came to be among us, a brethren. Now, look at this. This is amazing, folks. And they came to Jericho, and as he, was, and as he went out of Jericho with his disciples, a great, multi, a great number of people, blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus said by the highway side, begging. Look at this. There's something missing here. I says, who writes like this? And they came to Jericho, and as they went out of Jericho, huh? They came to Jericho, and it's like, like something missing. Right. They came to Jericho, and then he went out of Jericho. Well, why can't you just say, we went through Jericho? But that's not what it says. It's like the Lord says, pay attention. And he's mentioning twice. Jericho's mentioned twice immediately. Why do you have to be redundant like that? There's a reason for it, folks. God wants us to look into this. Look at this. We saw for the, the kingdom, they shall not, hardly will they enter into the kingdom of God. That's what we, we, we saw in 23. And then it's repeated again in 24. Hard it is for them to, that trust in riches to enter into the kingdom of God. And then 25, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. All this are about people that trust in the riches or it's very hard for them. It's near, it's impossible. That's what we're told. Okay, they're about to enter in. This is what Jer Jericho is the doorway into entering in. But Jericho is very special, folks. Notice the riches and rich. It's all about riches because riches... And I, as I read that, I said, wow, there's something here that I haven't really paid attention to. But, you know, we, want, we that want to be rich, you've got to be very careful. Because if you got your wishes and you became rich, you know, it's very dangerous. Because very few people can handle that. Uh, and we see that all the time with sports figures. Yeah. You know, we see it all the time. Um, hardly will the rich enter in the kingdom of God, we're told there. Why is that? Jeruz uh, Jericho is a fortress. That's what it is. And when they first came into the land, it stood right there with Joshua. Joshua had to go in there and conquer it. Um, it stood there in the way of the cross. It stands in the way of entering in. It stands in the way. What is that? It's a fortress. It's a stronghold. That's what we're told. And you're going to have to, it's very difficult to overcome. We know that. They had to go around that structure for seven days 
one, uh, for six days, one, down, one time at a time, just go around it, and on the, on the sixth, seventh day, seven times, and that walls came tumbling down, you know. And guess what? This, we're told this, and, and Joshua 6, 18, and ye in any wise keep yourselves from the accursed thing, but all the silver and the gold and the vessels of brass and iron are consecrated unto the Lord. The Lord says, everything you find there is mine. Don't get nothing. And we know what happened. There was a man that took a uh, Babylon Babylonian garment, a wedge of gold. He said, man, and he went and hid it in this tent. And we know what happened to him. He, he, he was undone. Um, we're warned about that. And we know there was a woman that lived there. Look what we know about her. Her name means proud, and she was a prostitute. What's a prostitute? A person that sells her body for money, sells herself for money. That's what a prostitute is. And that's what that means. If you live there, this is what you, you've done. You sold yourself for a pot of beans, you know? And Luke, Luke 19, 1, And Jesus entered in and passed through Jericho. And behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus. That's another thing. Which was the chief among the publicans, and he was rich. Notice anybody that lives in Jericho, they're rich. We're told that. And so there's a problem with Jericho. The problem, because they never enter in. They stay there. Um, and he sought to see Jesus, who was, and he could not. Now, we, we're told he was short. That's why he couldn't. That's why he had to climb up a tree. Ah, important. He climbed up a tree, the cross. You know, that's the only way you can see it, because you can't see the Lord. If you're rich, it's very difficult. So the disciples said, Lord, well, who then can be rich? I mean, who then can be saved? And he's going to show us. Oh, in this story, he shows us how it's possible. You know, he shows us. It's amazing. The Bible is amazing. Because look what happens. And they came to Jericho, and as he went out of Jericho, there it is again, with his disciples and a great number of people, blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, sat by the highway side begging. This is strange, folks, because Bartimaeus means son of Timaeus. Why would you repeat that? Son of Timaeus, the son of Timaeus, sat by the highway side begging. I said, well, that's strange. There's a lot of strange things in the Bible, folks. And this is why you got to read it with your brain really working in a cup of coffee. Yeah. And they deep, Now look at all the times. Look at this. In Matthew 20, 27 says, 29. And they departed from Jericho. A great multitude followed him. And behold, two blind men sitting by the wayside when they heard that Jesus passed by, cried out, saying, Have mercy on us, O Lord, thou son of David. Matthew says there were two. But Mark says, And they came to Jericho, and he went out of Jericho, and his disciples and a great multitude of people, blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, said by the highway beside begging. There's only one. But really, there's two. Because it's Timaeus, the son of, or Timaeus, the son of Timaeus. You know, it was a junior and his dad. Uh, this is, I don't know, there's so many ways to take this, folks. Because Timaeus means uh, val to value a high value. And I'm thinking, was his dad very rich? I don't know, I'm just saying, was he rich? Why was Bartimaeus begging? Ooh, that, the plot thickens. The plot why, thickens. why would he be begging if he's really rich? Because we know that most people that live in Jericho are rich. But they're also blind. They can't see Jesus. See? Wow. Now, Psalm 40, 17 says, but I am poor and needy. That's the way you're going to have to come to the Lord, folks. You yeah. got. That's the only way you come. Read Psalms. David says this over and over. He says, I am poor and needy, Lord. And David, he's rich. David is very rich. Yeah. All the silver and gold that he left his son Solomon, he wasn't poor, folks. And yet, over and over in Psalms, he says, but I am poor and needy. Yet the Lord thinketh upon me. They were begging. What were they begging for? They were begging for mercy. And if you do that, you're in the right place to come to the Lord. And that's what the Lord says. You've got to see yourself as poor and needy. And then no matter how much money you have, you're in the right place. And when he heard that Jesus, uh, and when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and to say, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy upon me. 
he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth. Now, Mark doesn't tell us this, but look at this. In Luke, we're told that, and hearing the multitude pass by, he asked what it meant. He says, what's all the commotion? And they told him, it is Jesus of Nazareth that passes by. Most people knew him of, he's the carpenter. You know, we know him. We know his brothers, we know his sisters, we know his parents, you know, da, 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 da. They didn't know him. They didn't know him. But this guy says, look what he calls him. Thou son of David, have mercy. He sees the king. Whoa. He doesn't see the carpenter. He sees the king. And he's blind. Really, he's not the blind one. The, right. other, the other people are the blind. It's amazing what the Lord is saying. Who gave him the faith? And the, the Lord is telling us, with God, all things are possible. Because, folks, if you come to the Lord, it wasn't you. You got it from somewhere. Amen. Somebody gave it to you. Somewhere along the line, somebody turned the light on you, and now here you are, you know? And you can never start thinking, oh, well, I was pretty smart, you know? Duh. It was the Lord. He turned the lights on you. And many charged him that he should hold his peace, and, cr and he cried the more a great deal. Thou son of David, have mercy upon me. Look at that. He keeps it. That's the king that's to come. And he's doing the right thing. Have mercy upon me. And Jesus stood still and commanded him to be called. And they called the blind man, saying unto him, Be of good cheer, be of good comfort, rise, and he calleth thee. The blind man that saw a paradox. Because huh? really, he, he saw. And he cast away his garment. This is important too. Casting a, a, a rose and came to Jesus, and Jesus answered and said unto him, What wilt thou that I should do for thee unto thee? The blind man said unto him, Lord, that I might receive my sight. He was already seeing. Now it's a physical thing. Remember? All the time we've been seeing how every, everybody comes to Jesus for physical, but Jesus says, I want to give you the spiritual. The physical will come. You know, yeah. get the phys get the real deal, then the, the, the bread will come later. Um, but he casting his garment away, that's his righteousness, folks. Because we all got to be covered. The Lord says, you got to be covered. If you go to the wedding, make sure you're in the right garment, you know, the righteousness of Jesus Christ. So you're going to have to be in the, in the right garments. He cast away his garment and took on the garment of Jesus. That's what I think is coming here. Oh, that's interesting how that's off. Okay. And Jesus said unto him, Go thy way, thy faith has made thee whole. And immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus in the way. Notice as thy faith has made thee whole. It was the faith that he didn't get by himself. Remember? Yeah. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourself. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Isn't that amazing? It's, just, it's the faith that made you whole. Not gave you your sight, but made you whole. Because look, and immediately he received the sight and followed Jesus in the way. Isn't it amazing? Now that ends this, and the next thing you know begins the week. Yeah. So let's look at let's, a, a little bit of taste. I'll just give you a taste. We'll start here next week. And they began, they came nigh to Jerusalem unto Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives. He sent forth is two, two of his disciples to go get the donkey, right? But look what it says, and just a taste. The fig house, Bethany, the date house, at the Mount of Olives. And I don't, I'm not quite sure if this is really where these places are located here. This is why I got to go spend in Jerusalem, go to Israel and spend about six months there to, to find those details there, you know. So if this church was really rich, it would send me to go live for six months over there, you know. <laughs> I'm just saying, I'm just saying. Okay, but, but anyway, look, look what, it's, look what it's saying here. Um, the Kidron Valley, folks, we've been seeing that through Genesis. Very important, very important. The Kidron Valley is very important because it divides Benjamin from Judah. And we look, look and saw how Benjamin is a picture of the soul and Judah is a picture of the spirit. Now, where do you find all this, all this fruit that the Lord was looking for? He was looking for fruit in the spiritual realm. But the, but the Pharisees and the Sadducees were all about the physical aspect. 
self-righteousness. The Lord says, no. He was looking for spiritual righteousness. That's what he was looking for. And you're going to notice, as we look at the last week, he never spends a night in the city. The throne was there, but he's been rejected. And he's going to be rejected. He's not at home. He will never be at home until he comes again. So look at this. And we're told in Nehemiah 2.6, And the king said unto me, The queen also sit him by him, For how long shall thy journey be? And when wilt thou return? And it pleased the king to send me and to set a time. So here, the Lord knows this is the time of his coming. We, he was reading this, folks. This is Old, Old Testament. I'm going to read what the verses I'm going to show you here. Uh, set, and I'll set him a time. He knew, look what it says in Daniel, 70 weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish that transgression and to make an end of sin and to make a reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness. 70 weeks, that means 70 times 7 is 490. And there, that's a reoccurring number. Which is interesting because the United States, if you go by, okay, Columbus, 1492, discovered the uh, Dominican the Republic, you know, so we're about eight years or, or 80 years off, you know, from that number. Or if you go by the Spaniards discovering uh, landing in Cortez, 1521 uh, or 19, we're past eight years. Folks, we're close to that number. Either way you take it, I don't know, you know, I'm just saying. That, and there, that's a cycle. Cycles of 490, 70, 70s, 70, 7, 70s. That's what that means. And look what it says. Know therefore and understand that the, from the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem unto the Messiah, that prince shall be seven weeks and three score and two weeks. What is that? Seven weeks is 49 years and then 62 weeks is 434, you add those together, you come up to 483, and there's seven years left. Where are those? Those are the seven last years coming. Now, he was cut off at this point. He's going to be crucified here. And what's left off before the seven week, seven years coming, the last ones, for the, that's his return when he comes back. And that's what we're waiting for. But in between is this place called the church. And this is what the Bible calls even the mystery which has been hid from ages, from ages and generations, but now is made manifest unto his saints. This is what's coming up next. And so we're, we're going to start right here. We'll start with this page and we'll look at the last week. Okay, let us close with a word of prayer. Lord God, thank you for your kindness and goodness. Thank you for your wondrous word, Lord, that teaches us um, all we need to know. Thank you for dying for us and for giving us eternal life. In your name, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. Good, good.